Thank you, Lord, for another Harvest Fest that we can celebrate as a church. Uh, I just want to say thank you for all you've done for us, Lord, for, for just keeping us and protecting us, Lord, uh, through the pandemic, everything you've, you've helped those, that even those in the church that got really sick. Lord, uh, you let them go through a lot, and Lord, even almost to death's door, but you, you intervened. We thank you for that. We thank you, Lord, that everybody's whole and good and well right now uh, for the most part. We pray for those that aren't and are having trouble. Uh, we just lift them up before you and I pray for your healing, Lord, for those that are in need of it today, Lord. Please be with them. Bless the sermon. Bless your people. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, uh, I always have a theme for the Harvest Fest. And the theme today, uh, I got this from my Bible reading. I got it from reading about the 10 lepers, which I will go to within the body of my sermon, where the Lord healed 10 and only one returned uh, to give thanks and was grateful for what the Lord had done. And, you know, I thought about it within our church, within the Christian communities, within Christianity. There are those that have gotten saved, those that the Lord has saved. And they know they're going to heaven. Some have been saved from very difficult lifestyle, from uh, sin and, and despair. But yet, we'll take the blessings that God gives to us. And like one of those lepers, 10 were healed. But how many came back? And today, how many Christians are serving the Lord? How many are grateful for what he's done for them? And today, I want to talk about gratitude and being grateful. And I think it very important. I think there's a lot in our country right now that people are not thankful for and they're not grateful for. And I think God is kind of upset and disgusted with just the overall attitude, the entitlement that people think they're just, well, I deserve this and I deserve that. And I'm somebody and I deserve this because I'm me. And really, aren't we servants? Aren't we servants? Who's the master here? Is it man or is it God? God's the master. You know, and I'm going to go over that today and talk about our position and how we should act and what we should be like and that we should just be grateful to God. You're breathing today, aren't you? We're going to have food after church. You can eat. Your mouth works. You can swallow. So grateful. Be grateful. Be grateful for what you have. Be grateful that you're living. Be grateful for the things in life that God has blessed you with. He could take that all away tomorrow. The Lord giveth, and the Lord taketh away. As they say, God giveth, and Uncle Sam taketh away. <laughs> Let's go to Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7. I always get a kick out of that one. God giveth and Uncle Sam taketh away. Luke chapter 7. The theme of this year's Fall Fest is gratitude. Luke chapter 7, and we'll start in verse 36. But before we do that, I'm going to give you a couple definitions. We'll start out with definitions. For the word grateful, grateful, having a due sense of benefits received, kindly disposed towards one from whom a favor has been received. Think about that. You're grateful. Somebody gave you something. You know, you were the, you benefited from that. You received something. Kindly disposed toward one from whom a favor has been received, willing to acknowledge and repay or give thanks for benefits as a grateful heart. Gratitude, the state of, state of being grateful, warm and friendly, feeling toward a benefactor. Kindness awakened by a favor received. And finally, thankfulness. Thankfulness is part of being grateful and gratitude. Uh, and don't we owe God so much? Uh, just to be grateful for what he's given to us. Luke chapter 7 and verse 36. And one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, 
when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment and stood at his feet behind him weeping and began to wash his feet with her tears and did wipe them with the hairs of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now, when the Pharisee, which had bidden him saw it, he spake within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. Right there, looking down his nose at this act, this act of gratitude, this act of thankfulness. This woman anointed his feet with this ointment, broke the alabaster box, very costly, we know that they said this ointment could be sold for 300 pence in another one of the Gospels uh, and given to the poor. You know, this could have been sold. This was a very expensive thing. How dare she break that upon his feet and then weep and, and, and wash her, his feet with her, with her tears and her hair. And then he looked with disdain. This woman is a sinner. If he were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman she was. He wouldn't accept this. Where was Christ looking? Right here. This act was a true and sincere act coming from right here out of her heart. You know, when you think about it, gratitude and thankfulness extends not through the actions that we do. It first starts here. And today, where is your heart for God? Are you grateful? Are you grateful for the things that he's done for you? Are you grateful for I mean, above all, salvation. He saved your soul. He forgave your sins. Washed them clean. Go to bed at night knowing you're forgiven. No guilt. How many people in this world live with guilt and bear the guilt of their sin all the time? They can't get it off of them. I know of a man the other day who's dying. And he said something to somebody I know. And I, I really like to get this man's name and go visit him. But he said something and they come and talk to me. And they said, this gentleman that I met, he said to me, and he's dying. He said, he doesn't have long, Kevin. And he said to me, he said, I wish, I just wish I could find forgiveness. He said, I look back over my life and the things I've done even to my very family. I just wish I could find forgiveness. You know why this woman was doing this? She found forgiveness. Amen. Have you found forgiveness? We have two people here. One is grateful. And the other one, <laughs> why this act? And the Lord calls him out on it. Let's keep going. It says, in verse 39, now when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, he spake within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, I, I really like how the Lord calls him out on this. I really do. Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he saith, Master, say on. You know, just because he called a master didn't mean that he reverenced him as master. Don't we oftentimes call the Lord master? Don't we often say, Lord, Lord? We don't mean any of it. Who is the master? Who is the servant? If we were truly servants and knew our place, we would be grateful to the master. He's the master. So he calls him master. Lip service, that's what it's called. Lip service. Master, say on. Verse 41. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed 500 pence and the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most and he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house. Thou gavest me no water for my feet. But she hath washed my feet with 
tear and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman since the time I came in hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. How much have you been forgiven for? You know, when the Lord forgives you, and he forgives you of so much, we should love much. And he said unto her, thy sins are forgiven. And they that sat at meat with him began to say within themselves, who is this that forgiveth sins also? And he said to the woman, thy faith hath saved thee, go in peace. Remember, the disciple is not above his master. Matthew chapter 10, Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10, in verse number seven. Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10 and verse number uh, 24. I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 10 and verse 24. The disciple is not above his master, nor the servant above his Lord. So the Lord says, you know, we're not above the master. We're below. He's up here. We are down here. I want you to turn to Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17. And now we'll go to verse 7, Luke 17 and verse 7. But which of you having a servant plowing or feeding cattle will say unto him by and by when he has come from the field, go and sit down to meet? And will not rather say unto him, make ready wherewith I may sup and gird thyself and serve me till I have eaten and drunken and afterward thou shalt eat and drink. Doth he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded him? I trow not. So likewise ye, when ye shall have done all these things which are commanded, you say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. Okay, now in this particular case here, we have a servant who goes out to the field and the servant works all day for the master. And the servant comes into the house at night. And the Lord says, now what do you think is going to happen here? Would the master of the house then tell his servant, hey, sit down. You worked hard all day. And I'm going to feed you and take care of you. Is that the way it is? No. The Lord says that's not going to happen. What's going to happen is the master is going to sit down and he's going to say, you've come from the field and you've worked all day. Your work is not complete yet. Now serve me. He said, isn't that unfair? But the servant is the servant. The master is the master. And when it's all said and done, no matter what we've done for the Lord, the Lord says that we are supposed to say, we are unprofitable servants. We have only done that which is our duty to do. See, man sees it a whole different way. And I was thinking about this. I was reading a note in the Ruckman Study Bible. And he talks about the origin of the word touchdown for you football players in here. What is the idea of a touchdown? Where did the word come and how did we get that word? We all know what it is. He's at the, he's at the 40, he's at the 35, the 30, 25, 20, he's at the 15. Oh, he sheds, uh, he sheds a would-be tackler at the 10, at the 5, he dives, he's across, it's a touchdown! And everybody in the touchdown, we scored! Where is the origin of the word? What is it? What is a touchdown? I should have brought my football, but I have to use the pops instead. You know, the running back and he gets there and it's a touchdown now today they have instant replay right Did the ball cross the play and they watch it looks like it 
Stan, what do you think about that? Well, I, let's call in the official for today, Gene Derator. <laughs> What do you think about that? Well, in my opinion, it hits the pylon and therefore crosses the plane and therefore is a touchdown. After further review, we have determined that the runner crossed the plane and therefore the ball went into the end zone and is a touchdown and the fans erupt, right? But in the old times, that wasn't a touchdown because you're six inches away from it. In the old times, the runner scored, and what he did was he placed the ball at the feet of the referee in the end zone, signifying a touchdown. The ball touches inside the goal line, the ground, therefore signifying a touchdown. The rules have been changed. Now it just has to cross the plane and it's a touchdown. But in the old times, it was a touchdown. And in the old times, the reason they did this was because the ball was given up and the runner just did his job. He was doing what he was paid to do, score the touchdown. And at the seat of the referee, and he would walk back. Whether the fans went crazy or not, he didn't celebrate. He just went off. Today, when they score, what happens? A production is made. Look at me. You know, they've got all kinds of things. They roll the dice. They spin the ball. They jump around. Everybody takes a camera shot. This is what society today thinks, even in Christianity. Look at me. I've done great things for God. Therefore, I'm great. We're only doing what we're called to do, right? So you scored the touchdown. You're only doing what you were paid to do. Is there a need for hot dogging? Is there a need for grandstanding? No, look at me. Hi, mom. They've gone as far as to hide Sharpies behind the, the, uh, the goalpost. They bring it out and they sign the football and give it to a would-be fan. This has gone crazy. Society has gone nuts. Everybody's, look at me, look at me, look at me. We are servants is what we are. And it's infiltrated into the church. We've only done what we're supposed to do. This is called gratitude. This is called being thankful. Entitlement, so much entitlement, we find it in the world. And I struggle with this particular parable in the Bible because it's not human nature looks at this and says, that's unfair, that's unfair. And let's go to it. It's in Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20. You probably read this. You probably get to the end. You probably scratch your head and say, wow, these guys here worked all day. This guy here goes out the midnight hour and then payday comes and the guy the, uh, the master takes a penny and gives it to the man who's worked hard all day who bore the heat and the burden of the day and he says here here's your penny and he also gives it to the guy who went out the 11th hour and worked one hour and he says here's a penny for you unfair uh, this causes a stir doesn't it let's go to matthew chapter 20 matthew chapter 20 and look in verse number one for the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is an householder, which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. And when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace and said unto them, go ye also into the vineyard and whatsoever is right, I will give you. And they went their way. Again, he went out about the sixth and ninth hour and did likewise. And about the 11th hour, he went out and found others standing idle and saith unto them, why stand ye here all the day idle? They say unto him, because no man hath hired us. He saith unto them, go ye also into the vineyard and whatsoever is right, this shall ye receive. So when even was come, the Lord of the vineyard saith unto his steward, call the laborers and give them their hire, beginning from the last 
unto the first. Now, I want you to think about this. There are people who have dedicated their whole life to God and served him from the day they got saved until the day they die. The expectation is when we get to heaven, that that person will be rewarded so much more than the person who got saved and really towards the end of their life, maybe they were saved on their deathbed. And the Lord will say, well, you got saved here. And therefore, because you did all this work, you have a greater place in heaven than this one. The Lord's fair, isn't he? But isn't he the master? And can't he do what he wants to do being the master? Salvation should be good enough for us. But yet we think about this. The logic here is the one coming in at the heat of the day sees that you hired somebody later in the day. Therefore, hey, I deserve what? More money. What's the agreement? What was the agreement? Here it was a case of need. The master agreed with you for a penny. He said, I still have work to get done. I got to get more labor. The master then hired them midday. The master then hired them later. So work still not done. A penny, a penny, a penny. That's unfair. They thought it was. Let's keep going. It says, call the laborers, verse 8, and give them their hire, beginning from the last unto the first. And when they came that were hired about the 11th hour, they received every man a penny. But when the first came, they supposed that they should have received more. They likewise received every man a penny. And when they had received it, they murmured against the goodman of the house. And I'll tell you what's happening in Christianity today. We've got Christians that are murmuring against the Lord. Murmuring. Always remember this. We, and I know I've said this, and I want to reiterate this point. We are the servant. He is the master. Sometimes the callings of God to the places that God sends people can be unfair as well, too. You know, if you're a missionary and God calls you to a Muslim country, think about what you have to suffer in that Muslim country and what you may put your family, you may end up being killed. Case in point, a man by the name of Jim Elliott, one of the greatest missionaries that ever lived. What happened to him? He was called to the Aborigines down there in South America. He was called to go down there, the tribes that people had never even met. And he went, plane pulled in, got off the plane, and before he could ever begin his ministry, they killed him. They killed him upon first sight, killed the man. You say, what was so great about him being a missionary to those men? He died never doing anything. What came of it? Anybody know the story? His wife and the wives of the other missionaries that died doing the same thing decided we're going to take up the work that those men endeavored to do. We're going to take up the work that our husbands endeavored to do. And they went down to those same people risking their own very life. You know what happened? They were received in and they won. They won many of them. I'm going to say all of them, but they won many of them to Christ. And they were able to break through. Hey, a penny for this one, a penny for that one. God is able to do as the master, whatever he may want to do, we are the servants. And it says here in verse 11, they start to accuse him. And when they had received it, they murmured against the goodman of the house, saying, These last have wrought but one hour, and thou hast made them equal unto us, which have borne the burden and heat of the day. But he answered one of them and said, Friend, I do thee no wrong. Didst not thou agree with me for a penny? Didn't you agree? Oh, yeah, we did. Here's your penny. I do thee no wrong. Didn't you agree with me for a penny? We did. Here's your penny. Didn't you agree with me for a penny? I did. Here's your penny. And this is what the Lord says. He says in verse 14, take that thine is. 
and go thy way. I will give unto the last, even as unto thee. Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own? Is thine eye evil? Because I am good. So the last shall be first, and the first last. For many be called, but few chosen. Now, again, entitlement. In the world we live today, there's a feeling of everything is owed to me. You owe me, therefore give to me. Our country can't keep on going the way it is. It can't keep on. This attitude cannot keep on going and produce a strong nation. We're not entitled. You know, we think about ask not what your country can do for you. Who said this? Ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. And this is the same with God. Ask not what God can do for you, but what you can do for God. And I'll tell you what stands above all is just that God wants to hear us say, thank you. Thank you. God knows we're flesh. God knows we're weak. God knows we get filled up with pride. He just wants us to hear us say, thank you. Thank you for what you did for me. Thank you for saving my soul. Thank you for coming down here and being among sinful men and knowing what you had to endure. Thank you for taking the cross. Thank you for laying down your life. Thank you for the wounds that you received in your hands. Thank you for the wounds you received in your feet. Thank you for bearing the crown of thorns. Thank you for bleeding and dying for me when you didn't have to. Thank you for dying for me, an innocent man condemned to death, scourged beyond belief, beaten with an inch of his life, till the Bible says that his bones stared at him, meat taken off of his body. Why'd he do all that? So we could say, I'm somebody? He knew what we were. Condemned, without hope, without God, on a road to hell, without a Savior, without a sacrifice, at enmity with God. But he laid down his life for us. He gave everything he could give so that we could have eternal life. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And I can't even make his death close to what he endured. No words can be put to what the Savior had to endure for, for the sins of mankind. As the Bible says, the Son of Man has come. Thank God. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but praise God, but now I am found. I was blind, but now I see. Oh, thank God, when we got saved, the darkness that we endured when we said, Jesus, oh, the darkness, oh, the overwhelmed feeling of sin, oh, the hopelessness that I have, oh, the condemnation I feel, oh, God, if I died in my sins, I would go to hell. I'm in need of Savior. I'm in need of salvation. I'm in need of forgiveness. In whom, the Bible says, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the mind. Unsaved people are blinded. They think they're okay. They think they have it the way that it's supposed to be. They think they're going to go to heaven when they die. They think all is going to be okay. But they're blinded and in darkness. But oh, when a sinner comes to Christ, oh God, I'm sorry. 
I'm thankful for what you did for me. I'm without hope. I need you to save me. Immediately in the heart, immediately the lights come on. No more darkness. The Bible says if the blind lead the blind, they shall both fall into the ditch. Oh, there are people who see, but they're blind. Spiritually blind. And that's the way it was before we came to Christ. When we got saved, the Lord opened our eyes. Amen. Isn't that worth being thankful for? And being grateful. I was reading yesterday James Nisbet, church pulpit commentary. He had a, he had a really nice paragraph here. He says, we are all naturally proud and self-righteous. Isn't that true? Man is naturally proud, naturally self-righteous. There's that element of pride that we just always bury within our heart. We always think that we are better than what we are. Amen? And if you can't amen this, I'll amen it. Because I know human nature, and I know men. And I've been around as a preacher for a long time, and I've heard, I've heard so many people. You pin them down to salvation, and next thing you know, there's an element of goodness that creeps out of them. I'm okay. God won't damn a person like me. I am fine. I've done this, and I've done that, and I'm a good person, and I go to church. Maybe I don't go to church, but I don't hurt anybody. I try to do what's right. I'm a good, upstanding citizen. Oh, pride, 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 pride. What do we read in our scripture reading? What was the last verse that Pietro read? What was it? Did you catch it? Did you catch it? Anybody? Y'all read it. Yay, he is a king over all the children of Pride. It's what caused Lucifer to fall. He thought he was better than God. Pride will put a man in hell. Pride. I won't accept Christ because I can do it on my own. Pride. In the end, you lost. Pride. This man says, we are all naturally proud and self-righteous. Seldom will a man be found, however wicked, who does not secretly flatter himself that there is somebody else worse than he is. Seldom will a saint be found who is not at seasons tempted to be satisfied and pleased with himself. There is such a thing as a pride which wears the cloak of humility. There is not a heart upon earth which does not contain a piece of the Pharisee's character. And what was that? God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are. I'm not an extortioner. I fast. I give tithes of all that I possess. Lord, I thank you that I'm not like this publican. I thank you. Pride, 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 pride. And this guy uh, smote upon his breast. God, be merciful to me. Can you figure out who the Lord commended? You might not even know the story. Who would the Lord commend? That guy or this guy? Lord said, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalted himself shall be humbled. He humbled himself. 
Humble yourselves before the mighty hand of God. Humble. As a servant. Go on. Thank you. We need to have a servant's mentality. Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23. It says in verse 8, but be, be not ye called rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father, which is in heaven. Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. See, that's what God looks at. He looks at the heart of a servant, a servant's mentality, and God exalts that person who's lowly. And I'll tell you this, when you get lifted up with pride, you open yourself up to the devil. Because the Bible says God resisteth the proud. And today, if you're far away from God and you're having trouble in your life, you better consider, has it, has it come because of the pride in your heart? Have you exalted yourself? And the Bible says that God push you aside. He'll push you away. He resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble, unto the humble. Okay, now we got these 10 lepers. Okay, let's go to Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17. Luke 17. Luke chapter 17. Gratitude. The message of my, the uh, title of my message today, Gratitude. And as I was reading in my Bible and book of Luke, I come across this and just jumped out at the page, the whole story. Luke chapter 17, verse 11. You know, and I want to say this before I get here. Leprosy in the Bible is a type of sin. Okay. Once leprosy got on a person, they couldn't get it off. There was no cure for it. It just ate the person alive. It's a neurological disorder, a disease, and it attacks the nerves. And as the nerves die, so does the flesh. And as the nerves die, the flesh dies, and it just eats the person. Just their body parts will fall off. It just the skin begins to deteriorate. Everything begins to fall apart. It's sin. Type of sin. Sin gets into a person. It just eats them alive. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. And you can see leprosy produces death. The wages of sin is death. Leprosy is found in Leviticus chapter thirteen, and if you read that, it's the disease that throughout the Old Testament just clung to men and could not be healed. So these 10 lepers come to Christ, okay? A type of 10 sinners. So we get this, it says in verse 11, and it came to pass as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered into a certain village, there met him 10 men that were lepers, which stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, go show yourselves unto the priest. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. Imagine that. Jesus, all 10, Jesus, master, hey, have mercy on us, all 10. And Jesus says from afar off, because they didn't want to get close to him. They could have. But they opted to be kind. And over here, we're not going to get too close. Maybe he was around other people. Jesus, master, have mercy on us. Go show yourself to the priest. And as they went, what happened? They were healed. All 10. What did Jesus want? Can I have a show of hands? Do we have sinners in here? We have sinners in here? Anybody? We have saved sinners in here. We have forgiven sinners. We have washed sinners. We have cleansed sinners. Okay, I didn't think that would be hard. Thank you for your hand. How many are grateful? 
How many have returned to give glory to God? How many have ever told anybody else? You know, the Bible says, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my father, which is in heaven. I don't know about you, but I would love nothing to hear, nothing more to hear than that Jesus said. Kevin Dragon confessed me before men. He was not ashamed of me. Therefore, I bring him right before you, Father. I bring him right before you, and I look up to God, and I see God. And I'm going to confess him before you. He is my child. What could be greater? What could be greater? Is your heart grateful today? Let's read. Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Verse 14, and when he saw them, he said unto them, go, your, go show yourselves unto the priests. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God. How many were healed? How many wanted healing? Oh, they had enough in their voice to say, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Heal us. We were lepers. Heal us. They had enough strength to do that, didn't they? But only one. And I tell you, this gives me laws of average. Out of 10 people that get saved, a tenth. A tenth will do something for God. 90% will go about their way. How shameful. How shameful. He did something so great for us. Right. He washed us from our sins. He made us a new creature. Can't we give him praise and glory? Can't we stay faithful to God? Jesus, no matter what, I may fail you along the way, but I'm sorry, I'm going to keep on walking for you. You're going to be tempted. You're going to be tried. You're going to fall. You're going to get sin in your life. You're going to have trouble. But don't quit. Don't give up. Be that one. God, all my days, I'm going to give you everything I have and serve you with all my heart, my soul, my strength, my might, everything. I'm going to give it all. I don't care what people say about me. I don't care what they think about me. I'm going to serve you because I am grateful for what you did for me. Gratitude. It's all God wants. Thank you. Thank you. He gave us these stories because obviously that's what he wants from us. It says in 16, it fell down on his face at his feet, giving him what? Thanks. And he was a Samaritan. And, and Jesus answering said, where are there not 10 cleansed? But where are the nine? Where are they? Empty chair, empty row, empty row, empty chair. Where are the nine? Hear the car? Hear the car? How many driving those cars today went to church? How many saved people will go up and down this road here say, I don't go to church? I met Christians. So where do you go to church? Oh, I don't go to church. And I don't believe you have to go to church to be saved. Yeah, you don't. But what an attitude. How grateful are you? Where are the nine? God was gracious to us. We owe him so much. We love him. Come on. We love him because he first 
love God. Demonstrated that love on a cross. You know, we weren't there. We weren't there. But I guarantee in God's mind, he saw every one of us. He said, Father, if it be possible, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, thine be done. Brother Mike, he saw you. Bill, he saw you. Samuel, he saw you. Rose, he saw you. Brian and Ashley, he saw you. Shelby and the boys, he saw you. Donnie, he saw you. Petro, he saw you. I don't want little Pietro to go to hell. I want to be a sacrifice for him. I love that boy. Tommy, I love you. I don't want you to go to hell. Tina Marie, I love you, and I don't want you to go to hell. I'll do it. Why you weren't even born. He saw you. He knew you were condemned. He knew you had no hope. I'll do it. I'll die. Though I don't want to drink from this cup. I'll be the sacrifice. He did it all. And all men have to do is come. Come. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come. You see, that's all I got to do is come. That's all you got to do. All you got to do. Fall at the feet of Jesus like that publican. Oh, God, have mercy on me. Oh, God, I'm sorry for my sins. Dear Jesus, save me. Will he do it? Who in here has done it? If you've done it, he's in there. He's in the heart. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice, I will open the door. September 21st, 1976. Oh, Jesus, I hear you knocking. I want you to come in, Lord. Come on, save me, Lord. 8.30 at night at an altar in church in Aliquippa. Kevin Dragonek down on his knees. Oh, God, I'm merciful to me. Lord, save me. Come into my heart and be my Savior. I hear you knocking. Come on, Lord. And guess what? He came in. And here's the beauty of it. He shut the door. And he's in there ever since. Do you want him in? The Bible says, call upon the name of the Lord. And thou shalt be saved. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Today on this Harvest Fest day, you can know Jesus Christ as your Savior. You can lock him in right now. You can pray this prayer and mean it from your heart. Mean it. You can pray after me. Mean this prayer. You can say just as simple as this. Dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. And I know I can't make it on my own. I know you died for me. Lord, forgive me for my sins. Please come into my heart right now. Wash me from my sin. Save my soul. And be my personal Lord and my personal Savior. Give me this gift of eternal life. Take me to heaven when I die. Lord, thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Bible says, ask and you shall receive. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you did that, you got saved. Now, walk in newness of life. Live for the Lord. Give glory to God and be grateful for what he's done for you. Amen. Let's be dismissed in prayer. Brian, you want to close us?